But today, I want to talk to you about this thought. Uh, you guys, you can just leave that there. I'm going to do that without the podium today. Um, I want to talk to you about this thought. Pass the salt. Pass the salt. Did you know that as a human, it is impossible for you to live without salt? Now, uh, how many of us eat too much salt? That's another discussion. But the fact is, you cannot live without having salt. Now, having grown up in the South, I understand the value of salt for good Southern cuisine. How many grew up in the South? Raise your hand. There we go, God's people. All right. So, uh, those of you that did not grow up in the South, you don't truly understand what good food really is, right? Okay. Now, uh, one of my things that I love is um, is grits. Okay. Now, when I was growing up, uh, my dad got a grist mill. Anybody know what that is? It was a hand crank thing. You put dried corn in it, and you'd wind it, and it had a little grinder in it, it would grind up, and you'd make grits or cornmeal. Uh, but I was responsible to do that. So I learned early on that if you love God and America, and you're not a terrorist, you do not put sugar in grits, okay? Because those people that do that, they really are. They're members of Al-Qaeda. They're trying to overthrow our culture, all right? Now, um, but you understand the value of salt, because if you love God and you really are going to eat good southern cuisine uh, in the form of grits, then you know that you put butter and salt, maybe some pepper, sometimes a little hot sauce. And if you're really trying to kick it up a little bit, you might add a little cream cheese or maybe a little garlic or whatever. But the point is this. You don't put sugar in grits. That's disgusting. That is ungodly, okay? Uh, if you stand before God and you have eaten sugar in your grits, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to go to heaven. That's all I'm saying, okay? But there's value in having salt, okay? And there's value in Southern cuisine. Uh, and if you're going to have good grits... Got to have some salt, okay? Now, Jesus used salt as a metaphor for the Christian life. Not just the Christian life, but for Christians themselves, okay? Uh, and he, he talked about the qualities of salt in your life. That if we don't have the qualities of salt, then we're really going to fall short not of the glory of God, but fall short of the purpose, the effectiveness that we're to live with in this life. So um, we need to learn some things about salt, learning about um, salt that if you don't have salt or if you are not salt, then your life is bland and it is pointless and it is without purpose. And so today I want to talk to you about as a Christian, what does that mean? As a follower of Jesus Christ, what does it mean to have salt in your life? Well, let me read a couple passages. One is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. These are the words of Jesus. Here's what he said. You are. This is important. Okay? You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So, notice what he said. You are salt. He, said you're, he didn't say you're to behave like salt. He said you are salt. But then he warns that salt can lose its saltiness. If that happens, he shows it's very difficult to get back. Now, here's the second passage I want to read, Mark chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. And these, once again, are the words of Jesus. He said, for everyone 
will be salted with fire. Now, sometimes it's hard to understand the way ancient people talked, but being salted with fire simply means that you're going to be tested, okay? And that if we are to be salt, then make no mistake about it, you as a Christian will be tested. He didn't say you might be tested. He says you will be salted with fire. And then he goes on and he makes a very valuable and important statement for us to understand about our Christian life. He said salt is good. Now, in this, he's not suggesting that salt is righteous or morally good or that it earns its keep by being good. He's just simply making a statement that salt is good, okay? Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, there's that expression again, if you've lost your flavor, if you've lost your saltiness, then how will you make it salty again? Very challenging thing. Then he says this, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, let me give you just three thoughts about salt and the Christian life. Um, and I hope you will, uh, maybe if you don't have the propensity or the inclination to write things down, you can go to the Bible app or you can go to uh, the church center out, and you can follow along with our sermon notes, okay? So that's just a reminder that you can follow along, you can read it during the week. Uh, so that is a good way to keep up. But I want you to think about three things that are very important about salt and the Christian life. Number one, salt is not something I do, it is something I am. I want you to think about this. Now, I, I really, in working on this message, I had some clever, alliterated, uh, rhyming points. I was very proud of it, okay? It's very, very good. But as I really looked at this and thought about it, I thought, you know what? Uh, the point of this message is not for it to sound clever or even memorable. The point of this message is to give you the truth that God wants us to see. And the first one is this. Salt is not what I do. It's not something I do. It is who I am. Did you notice what Jesus said? He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are salt. It's not that, you know, if you try really hard and you're very moral and you get along with people well, that you will be salt. He's just simply saying, as a Christian, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are the salt of the earth. Now, with that comes some implications. Okay, if I am the salt of the earth, then how I live is incredibly, incredibly important. I understand this, that if I am the salt, and, and, and you get the idea of this metaphor that uh, we're going to add flavor. We are going to uh, be preservative. We are going to be uh, the one that is necessary for life. That's what salt is. Okay, without salt, there's no life. Without salt, there's no flavor. Without salt, there's no preservative. Without salt, it can even be used for, being, for cleansing. Okay, so without salt, things fall apart. So, so once again, come back to what he said. I am. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I am the salt of the earth. I am salt. Salt is not what I do. Salt is who I am. Now, if I am going to be effective, if I am going to live in a way that pleases God and God uses me, uh, then you're going to understand that you are going to be the only Bible that some people read, you're salt. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're salt. Now, and we'll get to this in a moment, but some salt loses its saltiness. 
its effectiveness. So he says, you're salt. As a result of that, here's what I get from this. How I live, how my testimony is, is incredibly important. I can lose my saltiness. And there are lots of reasons we lose our saltiness. And I'll maybe talk about that in a moment. But here's what he's saying. That you may be the only Bible that some people ever read. You are God's representative. Now, are there believers, are there Christians that are not salty? Yes, according to what Jesus says. Are there Christians that are not effective as salt? Yes. Um, but make no mistake about it. It's not that, you know, hey, if I, uh, you know, check all these boxes, if I'm a member of the church, and if I, you know, say my blessing before I eat lunch, wherever I work, if I do all these things, then people are going to think that I'm salt. Look, he's saying that you are salt. You are salt. And how you live, what you do, matters. It matters. And once again, this whole idea of being aware that, of who you are, of being aware, there's a purpose behind that. Why? Because salt is designed to enhance, to bless, to give flavor. And, and so what God wants you to understand is that your life Really, if you want to boil it down to its purest and simplest explanation of what he's talking about in this metaphor is that your life is supposed to draw people to Jesus. That's what he means. That's what he's saying. And look, there are a lot of Christians that do not draw people to Christ. There are a lot of Christians, I would say, that repel people away from Christ. Maybe with their attitude, maybe with their behavior, maybe with their, I started to say personality, but you can't help your personality, but you can uh, help how you behave, right? There are some Christians that they want to be argumentative about everything, and they want to uh, say things that the Bible doesn't say, and they want, to, uh, they want to be belligerent toward other people. God did not call you to win an argument, God called you to be salt. Now, to be honest, I love, 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 not only to get into discussions that you would call arguments, I love to win them, okay? And how many of you like to be right? Raise your hand, okay? And those of you that uh, don't have your hand raised, you're either not listening or you're lying, okay? Okay. We all like to be right. We all like to be the one that is right, gives the right answer, knows the right thing, okay? You ever notice how sometimes that if you know something and someone else is wrong, that sometimes you get so smug and you're so, you know, you get this smirk on your face and, you know, you just get ready to drop a truth bomb on somebody? Well, here's, here's what you need to understand, that God didn't call us to win arguments, he called us to be salt. And you can win every argument that there is, but have no drawing power to Jesus Christ, okay? So what is he saying? He's saying that I must draw people to Jesus. That is first and foremost what God wants me to do. That's who I have been created by God to do. That's, uh, that's what I've saved by God to do. My job is... To be salt. Why? Because I am salt. I am salt. Some, not something I do. It's who I am. Now, here's the second thing I want you to understand. This second truth is that I am salt because of my relationship with God. You're not salt because you vote for a certain political party. You're not salt because you grew up going to Sunday school and you haven't missed a Sunday in years. Uh, you're not salt because, you know, you don't smoke, dip, or chew, or run with girls that do, all right? You know what I mean? You're salt because your relationship with God. 
That's what God has called you to do and to be. You are salt because of your relationship with God. Um, now, I want to show you this. and This is just something that uh, maybe you'll think about a little bit later. Salt was a sign of God's covenant with the children of Israel and God's covenant to save us. That's what salt was a sign of. So, I'm salt, not what I do, it's who I am, it's who I've been called by God, but I am salt not because I'm a good moral person. I am salt because of my relationship with God. Now, let me give you a couple of thoughts about uh, these covenants. There, there were a few covenants in the Old Testament that were referred to as a covenant of salt. Now, what is a covenant? It is an agreement. It is, a, uh, it is love based on a relationship. It's based on a relationship of love. So, uh, for example, a contract is different than a covenant. If you sign up for a cable TV program or you sign up for internet or a phone, you can get a contract. When you sign uh, to buy a house or to rent an apartment, you sign a contract, okay? And that contract is legally binding, right? A covenant is different than a contract. When it comes to your relationship with God, it's not a contract. It is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Now, is a legal contract? Yes, but it's more than that. It is based on love. And so when God made a covenant with us, understand, it's not because God is going to take you to court and say, well, you didn't live up to the laws of this contract. That's not what he's going to do. What does he do? He draws us to himself because he loves us. A covenant, it's a forever thing, and it is based on love. So, uh, couple of covenants I want to point out to you. There was what was called the priestly covenant. The priestly covenant. That was called a covenant of salt. The priestly covenant made it possible for priests to perform the sacrifice for sin. All right? Get that? The priestly covenant allowed the priests to perform the sacrifice for sin. Did you know that in the book of Hebrews... Jesus is called our great high priest. He's better than Aaron. He's better than the sons of Aaron. He's better than Moses. According to the book of Hebrews, Jesus is our ultimate priest. What does the priest do? I just told you. What does the priest do? Makes the sacrifice for sin. What did Jesus do? He made the ultimate and the permanent sacrifice for our sins, thank God. That's who Jesus is. So I am salt because of that covenant of salt, that covenant with God that Jesus performed for me. He is our high priest. Thank God for that. But then there's another covenant, uh, and it's called the Davidic covenant. That means the covenant of David. Now, it was prophesied through the Davidic covenant. And remember, it's the covenant of the king. So we got the covenant of the priest. And the Davidic covenant was the covenant of the king. So what did God make a covenant with David to do? That there would be a forever king on a forever throne. That's the covenant of David, okay? And God told David, he said, there is going to be a forever king on a forever throne. Now, why is that important? Because um, in the Davidic covenant, God promised us, there's so much in it. A forever king, a, a forever throne means that he is going to be our king forever. And that when we come into a right relationship with God, when we get saved, when we become followers of Jesus Christ, what does he do? He puts us in. In that covenant, as a covenant of salt, salt representing something that lasts, something that's eternal, and he says, I'm going to be your Lord, your King forever. Now, why is that important? Well, because uh, the Bible is clear that 
Jesus is our Lord. He is our King. What did Jesus come as the first time? What did he come as? He came as the Lamb. He came and he was meek. And, um, you know, he wasn't always meek on everything. A lot of people try to paint this picture of Jesus that he was like, you know, a person that wouldn't ever raise his voice or wouldn't ever, you know, do anything aggressive. That's just simply not true. Jesus was not a vegan, okay? That's what I'm saying, all right? So, uh, so um, uh, and I apologize if you're a vegan, all right? Uh, but uh, I would uh, challenge you to an arm wrestling contest afterwards is all I'm saying because you're weak, all right? So, but nevertheless, uh, Jesus, what is it? What is it? He is the forever king on the forever throne. That's who he is. So he's our priest, and he's our king. He is the one who made the sacrifice for our sin, and he's the one that has the authority in our lives to give us salvation. So I am salt not because of what I do. You don't become salt because you're a good person. You don't become salt because you go to church or you join the church or uh, you live a moral life. Now, are those things good? Yes. But that's not why you are salt, okay? My saltiness is based on my relationship with God, okay? It is based on the fact that Jesus is the one that fulfills the covenant of salt. He's the covenant to be my priest. He's the covenant to be my king because that's who he is. And then finally, here's the, the, lo- the last thing. And by the way, if you want to see how this is uh, pictured in the verse we read today, he said, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The interesting thing is that when we have peace with God, it means we're saved, okay? We make that peace with God through the covenant. Then we get the peace of God. You know the difference, right? I have peace with God because I'm going to heaven. I have peace with God because I have a relationship with him. I have peace with God because I'm forgiven, because I'm redeemed, because I'm justified. I have peace with God because of the work of Jesus on the cross, because Jesus offered forgiveness, right? That's the peace with God. But the peace of God helps you to sleep at night. The peace of God helps you to live a life that is a peacemaker. In the Beatitudes, what did Jesus say? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. He didn't say the peacekeepers. He said the peacemakers. Now, what is the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker? A peacekeeper will, uh, they'll bend, they'll kowtow, they will do whatever they have to do to preserve peace. Why? Because they don't want to get in an argument. They don't want to, They don't want to offend. They don't want to be wrong. What is a peacemaker? That is someone that builds peace in the culture, in their family, in their own life through through the fact that uh, they are living by the gospel. A a peacekeeper would tell a person, well, you're a good person. You're probably going to heaven anyway. A peacemaker tells someone, You must receive Christ. You must come to him. That is how you make peace with God. That is how you go to heaven when you die. Okay? So, point number one. Salt is not what I do. It's who I am. Point number two. I am salt because of my relationship with God. And then finally, uh, point number three. God will test my saltiness. God will test my saltiness. Everybody say salty. Salty. Look, what God wants you to understand is that you're going to be tested. Now, will we be tested with the trials of life? Yes. I I, I used to serve this pastor, work with this pastor, and he was a very, uh, had a very big vocabulary. And he, he would use the word vicissitudes. And he would talk about, when you're talking about this, the vicissitudes of life. Now, you may not know what that word means, okay? I went a long time, didn't know what it meant either. But here's the point. 
God's going to test you with all the things that, all the trials, all the troubles, all the things that come your way. He's going to test you. Life, to a great degree, is a test, okay? You're going to be tested. Now, Jesus said, for everyone will be salted with fire. What does that mean? Well, fire tests and purifies. So going through the fire, going through the difficulty, going through the trials will help purify you. Now look, there's one of two reactions you can get to the trials of life, to the tests of life. You can either let it make you better or make you bitter. A lot of people choose bitter. And because they go through testing in life, they get angry at God. And they want to throw in the towel. They want to quit. They want to say, there's no hope. There's no point to any of this. But it is when you understand that God will let you go through fire to make you better, which, by the way, did you know that according to the book of Job, it is through our suffering that God rescues us? It is through our suffering that he gets our attention. Have you ever noticed that often uh, when things are rosy, when things are perfect, we don't really think that much about God. We think about vacation and going to the beach, and we think about you know, how many uh, followers we have on social media. We think about all kinds of things, okay? We think about how awesome life is. But often it is when you're going through trials that your attention turns to God. It is often when you go through testings that God will get your attention and you'll truly begin to follow him. You'll truly begin to love him. You'll truly begin to pray. You ever notice that your prayer life's probably a little stronger when you're going through difficulty? You ever notice that your prayer life is a little stronger when you have pain? Now, I don't like pain any more than you do, okay? But the point is this. You know, a lot of people really struggle with this question. Why does a loving God allow pain in life? Well, there's a long explanation to that. Uh, because God loves us and gave us the opportunity to, uh, to follow him, okay? Um, you cannot have love without the opportunity to choose, okay? Uh, it's also that, uh, you know, God in his sovereignty, God in his um, understanding allows us to be drawn to him through the pain, through the suffering. And often people wonder, why does a loving God let us suffer? Well, the main reason, I want you to understand, is not necessarily because of your sin. Jesus talked about this when, remember when he went to heal this blind man and his followers said, who sinned, this man, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. But this happened for the glory of God. So often uh, we think that our struggles are because of something we did, and that can be, but struggles ultimately are because this is a sin-cursed world. And there's coming a time when Jesus will make sure that sin is no more in this world. Hallelujah, okay? And the fact is, you and I are going to be able to experience what it's like not to have pain. If you're a follower of Christ, when you are resurrected, okay, when you are with God forever, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more struggling, no more sadness. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day, okay? And, and here's the point. God will test you. And understand this. Sometimes the testings that we go through are just life. I don't know if you know this or not, but the older you get, the more you're going to suffer, okay? Okay. And I'm talking about physically, all right? So, you know, when you're young, you don't really think about the consequences of eating a whole gallon of ice cream, all right? So when you get my age, you're like, now what's that going to do to my blood sugar, all right? Uh, when you're a young person, you don't think about uh, at all 
staying up all night, hanging out with your friends, playing video games all night, and having to go to work the next day, okay? Because you can always take a nap while you're working, right? Okay? But when you get older, you realize you can't really do that anymore. I was like, I heard one guy was like, you know, he said, uh, when you get older, uh, you discover things. Like, for example, um, he said, I got out of the shower, I dried off completely, and I thought I was completely dry. But when I bent over to get the deodorant out of my cabinet, a pint of water poured out of my belly button. <laughs> what, what was the point? You're going to struggle in life. Sometimes it's just life. And I, I don't know if you know this or not. But sometimes the reason you run out of gas is because you didn't put any gas in your car, all right? Not because the devil's against you, not because you're uh, being tested and tried in life. Maybe you should have put gas in your car when it needed it, okay? So not everything is, you know, necessarily a test from God. But you know what? Sometimes life is life. And sometimes, you know, the longer you live... You get older, and things happen, okay? Sometimes you get aches and pains. Sometimes you get arthritis. Sometimes you have to go to the doctor more often, okay? Uh, you know, when I was a young man, I never went. To, I never got an annual checkup. I never went to the doctor. Now they want me to come to the doctor about every three months, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, why do I have to go to the doctor so much? But you know what? That's called getting older. And sometimes we go through trials not because the devil's out to get us and not even because the Lord is trying to test you. Sometimes that's just life. And, and, and I, I really don't have um, time. Let, let me just say this. Jesus said salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? And his point is this. Don't miss this. You are going to be tested. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tempted. Okay? One, uh, according to what he was saying there, one of the temptations, you know what it is? Is to get slack. Not to be faithful. Not to be involved. What, is, what does he mean by that? You'll lose your saltiness. You'll lose what makes your Christianity unique. You'll lose what draws people to Jesus Christ. What Does it mean you lose your salvation? No, I don't believe that at all. But what it means is that every one of us, if we're not careful, we will become not very salty. And by salty, I don't mean like, you know, the old man that's got a, you know, get off my lawn kind of saltiness to him. I don't mean that. But by saltiness... By drawing people to Jesus, by being an example, by uh, putting flavor in this world around us, by uh, creating thirst in this world around us for a relationship with God, uh, through preserving uh, what is right around us, okay? The point is this. He says that I'm going to be tested and I must remain faithful because if I don't, I'm going to lose my saltiness. And by the way, according to what you read in this, if the salt loses its saltiness, how are you going to find it again? He didn't say it was impossible, but he's saying it's difficult. I've been a pastor for a long time, and I know uh, I've seen it. I've seen it, in fact, since COVID-19. It's always been around, but it's really been around since then. You know what I mean by this? That, you know, COVID-19 caused a lot of people not to go to church. Did you know that since COVID-19, that church attendance in America is less than 50% of what it was before COVID-19? Still to this day. What, what does that mean? There are some people that lost their saltiness. And here's what he said. It'll be difficult to get back again. There are a lot of people that I believe are followers of Jesus. They've been saved. They just aren't living for God. And I realize that's an old-fashioned preacher way of saying things. They're not being salty. You know, they're not giving. They're not reaching people. They're not making a difference. They're not fellowshipping together. They think that because they 
for a while watched online, and I'm not saying it's wrong to watch online, I'm just simply saying I don't really believe that that many people watch online. He said, where do you get that from? You're not very trusted, because I look at the data. You know, we have uh, supposedly a lot of people that watch online, but you know the average length of time that people watch online? Four minutes. Four minutes. Now, you can come to the conclusion you'd like, but if you're watching the service for four minutes, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you're not really engaging in your relationship with God as far as the church or listening to the message. And maybe they're listening on super fast speed and they hear what I say, okay, maybe, but I doubt it, okay? And my point is this, when you lose your saltiness, it's hard to get back. Not that you can't, not that God doesn't uh, say that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, not that we can't repent, not that we can't turn to Him, but I'm just simply saying, guard yourself why? Because you are salt. That's not what you do, it's who you are. Um, you and I need to make sure that we are living a life that guards our saltiness, that makes sure that we understand my saltiness is not because I'm a good person. It's not because of my habits. My saltiness is because of my relationship with God. And if I'm going to stay salty, i got to make sure that I don't give up on that relationship with God. And by the way, you know how to keep that relationship with God hot, passionate? Go to church, that's one thing. Read the Word of God and pray regularly, that's another. Meditate, think about, who take communion regularly. We take communion every Wednesday at our prayer time, I love it. What does that do for a person? It helps you remember. And when I remember, I'm going to stay where I need to be more likely. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, anyway, I've talked enough. Lord, thank you for uh, what you've done for us. Thank you that you have said that we're salt. God, help us to be salty. Help us to live our lives in a way that pleases you. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Ushers, go ahead and come. If you have a next step card to drop in, remember, if you want to serve on social media or in the office or something like that, mark that down. And don't worry if you didn't get it filled out. You can drop it in the drop box on the way out, okay? Give in the offering today. Remember, we are being faithful to take up uh, and help for the Children's Village in South Africa. And uh, so you don't want to miss that opportunity. And uh, then uh, don't forget that we are going to be on July 21st live in South Africa. You're not going to be. I'm going to be. Uh, but uh, we're going to uh, let you see a lot of the stuff that's going on over there. And it's going to be encouraging. And so I hope you'll be a part of that. Today, if you'd like to receive Christ, say, what does that mean? Why don't you come, and I'm going to make sure that we have our prayer team over here. If you'd like to talk about what that means, then you come see one of them. If you'd like to join the church, we talk about joining. I don't mean like how you join Facebook. Joining the church is about participation. Now, we have a membership class. We call it the Next Step class, and we do it once a month. But if you're interested in that, we'll do it next Sunday, okay? But I'm going to say the way to join is to get involved. Participation is membership. Um, you know, you don't really qualify to be a member if you're not being a part. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Thank you for coming today. I want you to know that I love you. And those of you online, thank you for joining us as well. Hope you have a blessed week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day.